as we join on 15. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost,
Almighty God, we beseech you, show your mercy to your humble servants, that we who are who put no trust in our own merits may not be dealt with according to the severity of your judgment, but according to your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. We have 
loving admonition, but also the Lord's concern for his faithful. His intention is to gather his elect, that they may share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Jesus told the disciples, certain signs will be announced the coming of Jerusalem's destruction. But no such special signs and particular signs will be announced at the judgment of the world. For as the light comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. The Holy Gospel is written in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew, reading verses 15 through 28. Please rise for the reading. Spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down and take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back and get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be equal again. If those days had not been uh, cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, Lord, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the desert, do not go out. For here he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. <coughs> here ended the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
almighty, eternal, and merciful God, who by your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, has established the kingdom of grace for us, that we might believe in the forgiveness of our sins and in the holy Christian church here on earth. We ask you graciously forgive our sins through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask this all in his name. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is written in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, reading again verses 13 and 14. We read as follows in Jesus' name. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. O Lord, sanctify us by Your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The saying that ignorance is bliss at times can be very true. When we see people doing jobs that we know nothing about or that look very difficult, we are glad that we are ignorant about doing them. We can also be uh, ignorant or glad about things that we, when we think about gossip that floats our own town. For I don't know about you, but I really don't want to know lies and rumors about people's situations. And in that case, it is a positive thing to be ignorant. But ignorance is not always good, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Many times we are in the dark about something here on this earth, and in the long run it really doesn't matter. But... When we face things of spiritual ignorance, is dangerous, isn't it? If we don't know the facts about Christ's resurrection and His second coming, it can cause sorrow, can't it? This type of ignorance, spiritual ignorance, has one remedy, though. Knowledge. From scripture. So today let's look at ignorance is not always good and first we look at ignorance concerning Christ's resurrection causes unnecessary sorrow. Secondly, this ignorance is remedied so that we can comfort one another with knowledge that comes from scripture. Dear friends in Christ, the group of Christians at Thessalonica to whom Paul was writing, lived in a largely Gentile region of the country. Not any of them had any knowledge of true God before Paul came to them. And when Paul did come to them, he was only able to stay a short while. Needless to say, there was not sufficient time for them to come up with the questions they had or for him to be able to answer them everything. This coupled with the fact that most of them had grown up with heathen influences and were surrounded by heathens, led these new Christians to have some doubt, some questions concerning Christianity. And one of the areas in which they needed further instruction was concerning the events that would take place on the last day. There were some in confusion and worry about whether or not those who had already died in faith would somehow be left behind on Judgment Day. And the Apostle Paul then addresses these concerns in verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Many of us know the grief and sorrow when a loved one dies. 
And this is true even for a Christian. We miss that person because part of our life is missing. Perhaps there are other questions that bother us. Is the person going to remain in the ground forever? How will God ever be able to bring that person back to life after they have been gone for so many years? Those without hope in Christ have these questions too. But they won't be able to find the answers. Not knowing God's promise to Christians, an unbeliever can truly be overwhelmed by the grief at a funeral. For an unbeliever, there is no true comfort concerning a relative or a family member or a friend or even themselves. And quite honestly, I don't know how an unbeliever deals with all of this since they have no real hope. But thanks be to God, we have this wonderful knowledge of Jesus and hope. As verse 14 says, For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. If it is true that Jesus died and rose again, and all we indeed know it's true, then we know that Jesus, or that God will restore those who have our asleep in Jesus. On Judgment Day, those who believe, who were alive, and those who are asleep with Jesus will be taken to heaven. No one with faith in Christ, whether he died in faith, will be left behind. It's just not possible because of God's promises. We are given an outline then of the last days for which Christians are so eagerly awaiting, as it tells us in verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be always with the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it will be a glorious day of triumph for believers from all different ages. But a moment should be taken here to dispel the false beliefs of what is called the rapture, of which many books and movies have been written about. For the idea of the rapture may be taken in part from these verses. The teaching of the rapture is that all of a sudden believers will vanish into the air, be taken off the earth, and then at some point, after that, they will rule with Christ for a thousand years until judgment day. But these verses make it clear that Paul is talking about Judgment Day, of which no man knows the day or hour. When Paul is describing the end, there will be no more. The trumpet will sound, Christ will descend, the dead will rise, and believers will be caught up to meet Jesus. And then the final judgment. And in the final judgment, believers and unbelievers will be separated and the Lord Jesus will take believers to heaven to be with him. <coughs> condemn the unbelievers to hell. It is sad of those who have ignorance on the events that take place here. Do not even consider for a moment that Jesus will return. Ignorance, of course, will be no excuse on Judgment Day if a person does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior from sin or believe on Him. That person's future is clearly outlined as Scripture tells us. He who does not believe will be condemned. You see then that there is a sense of for all of us to get the message of Jesus out to people, 
We certainly don't want a person to go through life without hope. But even more so, we do not want a person to be in sorrow for eternity and be apart from Christ. An overwhelming sorrow that is not necessary in this life nor in eternity because Jesus is our hope. He is the answer. For he has rescued us from sin and its curse. We are instructed by the Lord and the Apostle here to take steps necessary to redeem the ignorance of a person that might have no future. Most of us have heard the words before that we use often at a Christian funeral. And we need to be remind ourselves just what these words mean. These words are from verse 18 of our reading. Therefore comfort one another with these words. There are times when words escape us, especially if we're trying to comfort somebody at a funeral. At a funeral we might say to them, well I'm sorry, and the person might derive some comfort from that statement. But there are many other statements we could use, words that we could tell them. We could remind them of Jesus' words. Because I live, you also will live. We can remind them of Jesus' promise to return and to raise the one who has died, giving them a glorified body for all eternity, to be in the presence of the Lord, we could use the phrase asleep in Jesus because for all Christians, death is really just sleep. A sleep from which we will awaken to everlasting life, free from all sin and curse of the law and pain. But what if we're talking to someone who doesn't believe that their loved one believed in Christ, then we must encourage them to be ready. As Luke 12, 40 tells us, therefore you also must be ready. Now Paul summarizes our hope and comfort when he writes verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And what appears to be the end is really the beginning for us Christians. Jesus was, has created this blessed hope for our future to, by dying to remove the sin, by rising again to conquer the grave. And at death, a loved one, the grief will indeed affect a Christian. There's no need to fool ourselves about that. Even with our knowledge of the Lord, we can't deny that we have experienced a loss. The grief over this loss will change our lives. It will affect our lives for many years. But we are still not to be without hope. Grief and sadness need not consume us, for God has given us one another. To bring comfort to each other. And when we need it the most. Nor dare we forget these words of comfort to others. To comfort ourselves. A question that probably plagues our human minds from time to time is this. How do I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? Where will I stand on that last day? The devil tries to insert these doubts into our heart to question our own faith. But a few questions and God's answers will bring comfort. So I ask you, was Christ's sacrifice on the cross good enough to pay for your sins? Well, yes, it was. For as the Holy Son of God, His shed blood was enough to pay for all the sins of the world. 
No sin has ever been committed that wasn't paid for by Jesus. Think of Paul, who persecuted Christians, even sawing, seeing them die. David, who committed adultery and murder. Or the thief on the cross, who was dying because of his sin. These were all sinners, but they entered heaven because Christ washed away all their sin. My dear friends, your sins are forgiven. Paid for by Christ, our Lord and Savior. There's another question that might come to mind for many. Will my life be good enough to deserve heaven? The answer, of course, is absolutely not. Our works are but filthy rags, the scriptures say. We could never do enough good to even make up for one of the sins that we have done in God's sight. We are nothing but doomed. But that's the wrong question to ask, isn't it, when we're looking for comfort? A question that could be answered for comfort is to focus that question on Jesus. Was Jesus' life good enough to please God? Yes, it certainly was. As true God and true man, He led a holy life for you and me. Since He did this in our place, we rely on His works and not on our own. Here's yet another question. Will I be, be declared not guilty by my works or by faith? And there we turn to Romans 3.28, which tells us, A man is justified by faith without the works of the law. So our righteousness comes through Christ. It is not by anything we have done. Therefore, it is foolproof. Brothers and sisters in Christ, use these words to comfort yourselves and to comfort one another. Look at the past and what Christ has done for us and look to the future as comfort and hope in our lives as He returns. Comfort yourselves with this knowledge, not of man's philosophy, of man's beliefs or reasons or thoughts, but of the knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. Ignorance can be good when it comes to getting us out of a difficult job we know nothing about. But ignorance is harmful and dangerous if it comes to the last day. Where can we find these Events about the last day, the blessings for a Christian that we will receive right here at worship, in Bible study, in reading your Bible at home and your family devotions. Yes, there is only one place to find wisdom, and that is in the means of grace, the word and the sacraments, where it gives us comfort. Here in time and hereafter in eternity. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Please rise for the general. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your great goodness and mercy. You have sent your only begotten Son to become incarnate and to redeem us from sin and everlasting death. We ask you to enlighten our hearts by your Holy Spirit through the means of grace that we may evermore give you thanks for your grace, and may we comfort ourselves with the same in all time of tribulation and temptation. Send forth labors into the harvest who teach the word in its truth and purity, that your joyous gospel may be heard in every land and nation. Grant health and wisdom to our government and all who are in authority. They may dwell in peace in this land of freedom. Send our land good weather and needed rains, that we each may eat our daily bread and offer our first fruits unto you. Bless the efforts of the businessmen, the workers, and all laborers. Help them in their needs. Provide all for their goods. Protect our homes and families from all danger of body and soul, that we may live a life pleasing to you here on earth and hereafter with you and all our brothers who have gone before us. And also, as we look forward to Veterans Day, God of peace, we pray for those who have served our nation and have laid down their lives to protect and defend our freedom. We pray for those who have fought, whose spirits and bodies are scarred by war, whose nights are haunted by memories too painful for the light of day. We pray for those who serve us now, especially for those who are in harm's way. Shield them from danger and bring them home. Turn the hearts and minds of our leaders and our enemies to the work of justice and a harvest of peace. Spare the poor, the sick, and the needy, Lord. May the peace you have left us, the peace you gave us, be the peace that sustains us and the peace that saves us. Christ Jesus, hear us. Lord Jesus, hear our prayers. These and whatsoever other things I would have ask of thee, O God, grant us unto uh, grant unto us for the sake of the bitter suffering and death of Jesus Christ, thy only Son, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our next.
again on page 24 with the promise. The Lord be with you. Welcome to 
Ortodossi.
goodness. When loving kindness did send thy only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank thee that for his sake thou hast given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we beseech thee not to forsake thy children, but evermore to rule our hearts and minds by thy Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve thee. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. If not, then may the grace of God go with you. 